Today I'm going to talk about Fire Marshal, which is a software workload management tool to make hardware software co-design a little more reproducible and reliable. So we're going to start with a little bit of background just to frame out the problem and what we're trying to address. It's really an exciting time to be a computer architect. We're seeing a huge improvement in our ability to simulate designs, both in the scope of the design we can simulate and just the speed with which we can do it. It's also getting easier to create those designs in the first place with a bunch of these open source SOC frameworks. And then finally, the software that we can run on top of those SOCs is also getting a lot more diverse and robust. So all of this is to say that it's actually practical to design these full stack SOCs. So what goes into one of these? Well, obviously there's the hardware component, and that's what's been the focus of all of those frameworks. But this talk isn't really about that. Instead, I want to talk about all of the software that has to run on top of that SOC. And collectively, I'm going to call this the software workload. And so when I talk about software workload management, I'm including a few different things. One is obviously creating the binaries in the file systems. You're going to need those software artifacts. But it's really more than that. You're not just going to build one production workload. What I'm interested in is managing an entire workflow, including many different experiments, tests, and all the other things that you're going to need to interact with software during the development process. And then finally, I want to be able to share our workloads with the rest of the community. This is to reproduce experimental results, but it's also just to build on work that's already been done. So to understand the sort of challenges that we might face in designing such a tool, let's go through a typical workflow. So I'm designing some accelerator, the super cool accelerator, and what I'm going to try and do first is write a specification of it, and this is just you know in prose. And then I'm going to make that specification concrete by developing a functional model. Now once I have a functional model, I can go ahead and start developing the hardware and the software. And ideally I can do this independently since I have the spec and the functional model. Now finally, once all of those are working to our satisfaction, we're going to need to evaluate them in some way. And so we're going to run them on RTL level simulation or using other types of tools. So what can go wrong here in terms of software management? Well, the first challenge that we're going to face is just dealing with the complexity of the software itself. There are an awful lot of components that go into one of these software workloads, and any given project might change any one of them. But it's unlikely that they're going to want to change all of them. And so in this example, say we only wanted to change Linux, this is going to lead us to our first requirement. I want to have flexible design. I want to be able to change anything without having to change or even know about everything else. The next thing is going to come from how we specify that workload itself. When it comes to the RTL, these frameworks have given us a really clear understanding of how to do that. There's a clear directory structure. It fits nicely into a Git repo. I think we generally understand what's going on. So what's the equivalent when it comes to software? Well, you're going to need a few different components. Obviously, you're going to need the sources that go into each of the different parts, but you're also going to need to figure out how to integrate those into a working image. And for that, you might have a whole bunch of different scripts that do different phases of that build process. But like I said, I'm not interested in building a single image. I'm interested in building a bunch of variants and rerunning experiments and all of that. And so for that, you're going to need to set up the experiments the way whoever, your, uh, whoever originally developed it did. And often what ends up happening is that you need to actually know them in order to ask them these details. And so this is going to lead to our second requirement. I want to be able to rebuild my workload from an unambiguous description, and I don't want to have to have Bob's phone number in order to do it. Now the final thing is going to come from once we have our artifact and we want to start developing and evaluating it. So most of the time, our development's going to happen in functional simulation. It's really fast, it's easy to iterate, but eventually we're going to need to run it on the RTL. And this is much slower, and ideally we would do this as little as possible. And the problem we're going to face is worrying about whether the workload that we spent all that time developing in functional is actually the same workload that's running on RTL. I want to be able to seamlessly switch between these levels of simulation. And so that's our final requirement. We want to have flexibility in the simulation platform we're using, and I want to minimize the differences both in the software contents but also just in my general workflow. Okay, so with these challenges in mind, uh, we developed a tool called Fire Marshal to try and manage this whole experiment lifecycle, this workload management. Fire Marshal is built around the four main phases of workloads. The first is specification. I need to describe what the workload is. Then there's the build phase, and that's actually constructing those artifacts. And then next, we're going to want to evaluate it uh, and just run it and develop it. 
And so for that, we're going to launch it in functional simulation or install it to external tools. And then finally, I'd like to repeat that whole sequence automatically so I can run regressions and continuous integration and all of that good software engineering practice. So let's start with specification and go into a little more detail here. To me, I think this is the most interesting part of Fire Marshall. So what goes into a workload? What sorts of things might we have to specify? Well, we're going to need the sources, so we have to describe the different components that go into it. Then we're also going to need to customize them in some way. And so we're going to need inputs and outputs, that is, configuring the software, um, configuring the file system, giving experimental inputs, but also collecting results once we've run an experiment or a test. Next, we're going to need to customize that. There's all of these different phases, and we might need to do some sort of custom logic in between each of them. And of course, there's actually just a ton of other stuff that goes into managing a workload, and these have come up organically over the time as we've run different experiments. So the question now is, how do you manage the complexity? There's really a lot of options that you might want to change here. And the way Fire Marshal is going to deal with this is through a mechanism of inheritance. And so workloads, they're not defined in terms of all of the different things that go into them. They're de defined relative to a base. And so in a workload, you specify only the things that have ch changed relative to some base workload. And the, to start that out, you have to bottom out on that recursion. And so to do that, Fire Marshal provides the board abstraction. And the board abstracts away all the different components that go into your hardware platform, and it provides this sane default starting point. You can then inherit from that base and start customizing any sort of arbitrary hierarchy you'd like. And we'll see a more detailed example of a typical pattern later. OK, so we've specified our workload, and now we need to actually generate the binaries and the file systems and all of those artifacts. So to do that, we run Marshall's build command. It's just a single line. And it's going to do a make style build. So it's going to detect dependencies and avoid rebuilding things unnecessarily. And this helps you iterate really quickly. So the first phase in the build is to run any sort of initialization scripts the users provided. This can do cross compilation or just generally set up your environment on the host. Next, we're going to build all of your parents. So we're going to go through that inheritance chain and recursively build everything that needs to be built. Next, we can go ahead and build your software image. So we're going to link the kernel against the firmware and do all of the boot binary stuff. And then finally, to build the image, we're going to copy the image from your parents and then modify it in whatever way your workload specified. OK, so we have a working image. We have a working file system. Now we want to start doing something with it. So we want to launch and install. So the first command, launch, is the one you're probably going to use the most often. And this is running it in functional simulation in a fairly tightly integrated way. Uh, currently, we support QMU and Spike, but you know it's a pluggable interface, and we could support other stuff. So what goes on here is that when you run Marshall Launch, your workload's going to boot through the normal Linux boot sequence. And then it's going to automatically run whatever benchmark or test that you've specified. When it's done running, it shuts down automatically, and it collects whatever outputs you want. And what's nice about this is it runs totally deterministically. And so there's no user interaction. And assuming that your simulator's deterministic, so will the run be. Next, we want to go from that functional simulation where we've done most of our software development and evaluate it against the real RTL. And for that, we're probably going to need a more complicated external tool that requires a little more configuration. And for that, we're going to use the install command. And all the install command does is it takes your Fire Marshal workload description and it converts it into a format compatible with whatever external tool. And we have a pluggable interface where you uh, define these constructors. So what's really nice about this, though, is that it doesn't rebuild the workload itself. We carefully design the board and the whole system in such a way that the same artifacts can run in functional simulation that run in RTL level simulation. And what's really nice about this is that you can seamlessly switch between those levels with minimal opportunities for mistakes and minimal differences that could introduce bugs. OK, so we specified it, we built it, we ran it. But what I'd really like to do is redo all of that periodically to make sure nothing's changed and nothing's broken. And so Fire Marshal provides a test command. And all the test command does is it reruns that whole workflow you just saw automatically. And you can do this for multiple tests simultaneously. Uh, and then what it's going to do is it's going to take those outputs and compare it against a known good reference. And you can run a script if you'd like that does a more complex correctness analysis. And you should run this regularly through a CI flow or just whenever you change something.
Okay, so we looked at the design of Fire Marshal and some sort of concrete examples of how to use it. So let's look at what it's useful for. Uh, the first one we're going to talk about is just trying to run a standard benchmark. So in the paper we talk about spec. Um, and what's nice about these standard benchmarks is that they're not particularly tied to any architecture. And so the system, the definition of that workload doesn't need to know about it. We did all of that hardware details, all of your platform details, those are encapsulated in the board and they were defined by somebody else and it was already done once. You just specified spec. And so this makes it really portable and it makes it run on a lot of different things and it's easy to share. So you can go download this. This is available online. It's open source um, and you can go run this on any platform you want. Next, we're going to look at a more complicated end to end example. And so if we're going to de design an accelerator, we're going to need to do a little bit more full stack uh, co-design. So let's take SHA-3 as an example. This is just a hashing algorithm. Let's say we built an accelerator to speed up this hashing algorithm. So obviously we're going to need to write our RTL and our functional model, and then we're going to describe the workloads that need to run on top of it. To do that, we're going to provide any sort of customized sources. So in this case, we needed to modify Linux, but not really anything else. We'll specify the benchmarks. So this is the sources for our tests and benchmarks and stuff. And then we're going to define a base workload that integrates all of those. And this base workload has most of the complexity in our software for our project. Once that base workload is defined, we can then define a bunch of variants of it to run our individual experiments and unit tests. And what's nice here is these variants usually only have two lines. They're going to specify the base, and then they're going to specify whatever experiment they need to run. And so all of that complexity was defined once, and all of the different variants that you have to write many copies of, those are really simple. There's also just a bunch of other use cases you could do. So we've done stuff with secure enclaves. We've done stuff with ML accelerators. Uh, we have this HLS-based design tool we developed. Um, it's also being used in classes at UC Berkeley. And we're in the process of building a board to help us bring up a new chip that we taped out. So I spent a lot of time talking about Fire Marshal, describing what it does, how it works. Um, but I want to take a step back now and talk about what we learned. So the first thing to note about Fire Marshal is that it's not a workflow management tool. So this isn't some generic tool to compose different scripts. There's a lot of good stuff out there that could already do that. So what did we learn? Well, I think the first thing we learned is exactly that it's not a composition of scripts. The real meat of Fire Marshal comes from the schema, the definition of the different things you can do, how they compose, the rules about how things work. And I think that's where a lot of the intellectual work went into this and part of why it works so well. The next thing is that it's more than just a build tool. So workload management isn't just building artifacts. It's about the ability to describe them in a consistent way, share them. And importantly, it's about being able to simulate them on different levels with seamless transitions. And that avoids so many problems that come up in the development workflow. And then finally, I want to talk about reproducibility. Now, this is a big goal that the scientific community at large is pursuing. And it's been really difficult to design tools that support this. But just because it's hard to do in general doesn't mean it's impossible to do. And I think Fire Marshal has been able to achieve this because it's focused on a particular design point. It's focused on a particular workflow. And because of that, it's able to solve a problem that, in general, was very difficult to solve. OK, so to conclude, we have Fire Marshal. It's based around these five steps of your software development workflow, where you're going to specify, build, launch, install, and then finally test. And it's going to do this for all of the different variants of your workflow, not just one production binary. It provides flexible design, so you can change anything, but you don't have to change everything. It supports maximal reuse. And so with its unambiguous description within a Git-friendly format, you're able to share and compose and build on each other's work. It supports flexible simulation, allows you to transition seamlessly between different levels of simulation. And it's designed for extensibility. So pretty much everything I described here has a clear API with a pluggable interface. And so it's designed to support many different tools, different boards, anything you really want to change. And it's open source to try and encourage that sort of thing. So to conclude, I'm going to thank my co-author, Alon. I'd like to thank Albert O, who's contributed significantly to the project, and the rest of the Chipyard team who've done so much to support this. All right, thanks.